everybody. How's everybody today? Well, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And um, welcome if you are visiting our church. Pastor Jerry and Lisa are inviting you to the Parsonage for an open house today from 3 to 6. Light refreshments will be served. Um, am I supposed to read the address? Sure, go ahead. 807 Mulberry Street in Sebastian. Now, the Florida Conference is encouraging churches across Florida today to make an offering towards the tornado victims and everything that's happened in the southern and mid-states. That was horrible. Horrible. If you would like to make a donation, you can mark your envelope this morning, M-C-O-R. Please make your checks out to the Rosalind Methodist Church, and you can also donate at um, HTTPS and then Florida, R-E-G dot B-R-T-A-P-P dot com forward slash 2021 tornadoes response. Okay. Okay. Um, and you can go online to see any other announcements. But that's about it. Um, we'll be having the Christmas Eve celebrations, right, at 4 and 7. Okay. And um, we'd like to say a prayer now. Father God, please help us cast away darkness and live in your light. We joyfully anticipate the celebration of your son's birth. We humbly await Jesus' return shall come to judge the living and the dead. May we now call him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. If you would, please rise and join us in Angels We Have Heard on High.
please join me in prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, our morning joy, our evening rest. We celebrate that you are not hidden in some faraway cloud, but you choose to be with us in the blur and mystery of our lives. In the midst of lists and rush, you are with us as a song that echoes in our minds, as the light of a candle, as a card from a friend. They are signs of your presence. We turn to you this season and pray that you would birth joy and healing, blessing and hope in us. Let something wonderful begin in us, something surprising and holy. Father, we know that this season doesn't spark joy for all. Some are dealing with the loss of a loved one, or the loss of health and vitality, or financial worries, or relationships that need mending. But you are Emmanuel, God with us. Draw near to us during this season, that we may have hope, peace, love, and the joy of your presence with us for all the days ahead. As we wait with anticipation, the reminders of your birth as a tiny baby to be our Savior and Lord, we share in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise and join us in singing Good Christian Friends Rejoice. When friends get together, it should be a joyful occasion every Sunday, but especially this, the last Sunday before Christmas. You know what brings me joy in the morning? Coffee. <laughs> Coffee may get me started, but Jesus keeps me going. <laughs> I wore that t-shirt somebody gave me down at uh, Light Up Sebastian. And some lady who came through was enamored with it. And she says, can I get your picture? And I'm thinking, huh. She says, no, the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to talk about joy joy. Uh, I'm not going to ask what your joy quotient is this morning, but what's the first thought you have when you hear this in church? 
Are you ready to get up and dance? If you are, then your joy quotient is pretty high. If you're going, what in the world is that guy doing to my church? Then your joy quotient is pretty doggone low. I use that for the children's chat at the first service, and I immediately lost control of the kids. (laughs) So, uh, joy, joy. I'm going to push against some of our concepts of joy and maybe give us a couple of helpful tips uh, for me and hopefully for you as well. Uh, But the first thing is this. Joy lives in the present. It doesn't live in the past. That's called a memory. And it doesn't live in the future. That's called a hope. So joy is meant to be one of the primary ways that you experience the life in Christ. But it must be lived in the moment. It doesn't mean that you can't remember the joy you had in the past, but it can only be created in the present. So what that means by implication, if you're waiting for joy to happen in the future, then you'll miss the joy that's here today. How many of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you either growing up or maybe in your house right now, you have towels that are not meant to be used? (laughs) Or China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you are raising your hand. I know. Yeah, yeah. But if you can't use them, what's the point? You're going to die. It's going to go to the thrift store. And somebody else is going to buy it, and they're not going to use it either. See, there's a difference between nice, nice and something that brings pleasure, joy. So if you're waiting for your joy to come, you're missing the joy that's here. And if all you can do is pull out the photo albums and remember the time when you were joyful. Maybe the kids were young. Maybe they still called you. Maybe your spouse was still around or alive. Uh, Those are great memories, and we need to treasure them. But you cannot live in the past if you want to experience joy, because joy is in the present. But we can't, as human beings, always live in the moments, the moments that can create joy. So, Let me ask, what are some of the ways that you experience joy or pleasure? Keep it PG-13, you're in church, okay? All right, so really, what, again, this is interactive, you're all adults, what is it that brings you joy, genuinely joy? Grandkids, phone calls, what else? What is that? Guinness beer, I like a man who's honest in church, and we're not even Presbyterians. What else? Marriage. Marriage. Yeah, marriage is meant to bring joy. Doesn't always do it, but it's meant to bring joy. Okay, what else? Good friends. friends. Oh my gosh, that's right. Anything else? Great music. music. Now, everybody has a different interpretation. You know, uh, some like the Beatles. Some think a Beatle is something you smash with a stick, okay? (laughs) But, you know, great music. And again, it's subject interpret. One person's pleasure is another person's pain. So, but we all have a general sense of what joy looks, feels, sounds, smells like. Okay, uh, it can be play. It's almost always playful, even if it isn't play. So, if I were to ask you, and don't say it out loud, when was the last time you actually played? Played. Uh, one of the greatest memories of I have of my grandmother. She was probably ancient. She was about my age at the time, I think. <laughs> Uh, but I remember we were driving down to Texas from Ohio because uh, we spent summers there. I always thought it was a great thing, but now I realize my parents just got rid of us for six weeks and they were excited, okay? But we would go down to Texas and spend four to six weeks with my grandparents. And we stopped at a roadside rest probably in Kentucky or Tennessee, and it had a lot of hills. And there was one hill that just called to an eight-year-old boy. I wanted to lay down and roll down the hill, but I knew my grandmother would get mad because I might get grass stains on my dungarees. They weren't jeans then, they were dungarees. And farmers wore them, farmers and kids and no one else. Maybe you didn't grow up in this past, but I did. But Grandma, instead of getting mad at me when I rolled down the hill and came up just laughing, having a good time, instead of getting angry, she says, oh, Junior, that looks like so much fun. You know what my Grandma did? She got on her knees and in her Skirt, because women always wear dresses or skirts. This is the worldview she grew up with. She rolled down that hill. I've never seen so, something so funny in my life. Legs flopping all over the place. And she got up, and she was four years old. <laughs> when was the last time you played? 
I'm not saying put limb and life in danger, but when was the last time you played? You did something that the intrinsic value was simply enjoyment. Enjoyment. You know, one of the things I've noticed in the church, maybe not this church, maybe not the churches you come from or grew up in, but the churches I've been part of, there's a little kind of a sickness, an unhealthy strain of DNA in the church that says you shouldn't have fun, at least not in church. That's why I'm so grateful for Buzz saying, Guinness beer, yeah, bring it on. You know, I'm Irish, I understand. <laughs> so here's the deal. You were created for joy, to have fun. And the fun needs to have some constraints. It's got to bring honor and glory to God. And when you play, that brings honor and glory to God. And it needs to be healthy for you and for others. There's some fun that is dangerous. There's some fun that injures other people. And so we have to consider what fun is. But that's this, your assignment this morning, to really look at what brings you joy. Now, you've been told, you've been programmed by society, by the church, by your family, on what fun is supposed to be. And you may have grown up, like a couple of my friends, who were very well up in one of the largest uh, law firms here in Florida, in, in Jacksonville. And one day we're out to lunch, and he confided in me, even though he was one of the principals in that law firm, a well-known name in the state, he says, I never wanted to be a lawyer. That was my dad's dream for me. And so he put me through school with that trajectory. He put me through college and law school with that intent. He connected me with the right people so I could get into the right law firm. And he worked himself up to being one of the primary partners. But he said, you know, I didn't want to be that. I wanted to be a culinary cook. And the fact that he didn't say a baker or a cook, he said a culinary cook. He w said that he enjoyed cooking. In fact, the first couple of times he took us out was, what was the name of that buffet? Barn Hills or something like that in Jacksonville. And you know what? It was just a buffet to me, but they made the potatoes the right way. You know, apparently there's a the wrong way. And they, the, the bread was fresh. So there's a thousand reasons why, uh, I almost gave you his name, he's gone now, but uh, why he just thought it was great. He was a lawyer. He was respected. He, he you know, had relationship with judges across the state, uh, but he always wanted to be a culinary cook. He enjoyed what he did. But his real joy was in a kitchen. It just wasn't what other people expected. So this morning, I want you to push beyond that veil. It doesn't matter what stage of life, how many steps are behind you, how many steps lie ahead of you. I want you to push behind that. What it really does bring you pleasure. What brings you joy? Because that's what you were created for. Read it with me, would you? Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Okay, stop. You've got to say it like it's written. It's got an exclamation point. You know what that means? You've got to exclaim. Are you ready? So let's read the first part, and when you get to that rejoice, lift your hands, and as loud as you can, say rejoice. You got it? Who knew you were going to be in a Christmas play? But here you are. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice! Congratulations. You are part of Christmas Eve. Christmas play. Uh, let your gentleness be evident by all. In other words, there are some things that bring you pleasure, but you have to kind of scale them back a little bit or time it right. Like Lisa was making some chocolate cookies for today's open house. And she said to me, she says, all right, I've got all the sugar cookies made and oatmeal cookies, right? And then uh, she said, I'm going to make the chocolate cookies. Usually when she gives me that two minute warning, I get in the car and go away. But it was 9 o'clock at night. It's my bedtime. So I went back in the bedroom, closed the door, turned on the vents all over the house. And so Lisa loves chocolate. How many of you love chocolate? You're normal. I'm Abby normal. Okay. So you have to make some accommodations. Your joy should cause pain to others. So let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? Because the Lord is near. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit. If you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whenever you're with anybody, the Lord is what? Why? Because he lives in you. So your happiness, your joy, should not be a point of pain in someone else's life. It's one of the primary, te 
excuse me, primary teachings of the guy who wrote this verse, the Apostle Paul. You know, let your joy be evident, but at the same time, make sure the evidence points to Christ, not just you having a party. So the Lord is near. Have you ever watched the child play with their parents nearby? Where do they always look for approval? To mom or dad, exactly right. Um, Take a look, this is not my daughter. Somebody asked if it was, and it's not. But it reminds me of when my daughter was this age. And she, we'd go to the playground, and she'd get in the swing, and I'd push her back and forth. She'd swing back and forth, and she'd say, watch me, daddy. Anybody ever heard that before? Watch me, daddy, watch me. I'd give $100 to have my daughter, who's like 31, say that to me today. Watch me, daddy, watch me. I love that. Did you know that's God and you? He wants you to look to him. As your primary source of approval, look to him as your primary source of pleasure and joy. God loves to watch you. He loves to watch you on the upswing when things are going well and you're doing it right. He loves to watch you on the downswing when things are going wrong. And maybe you're not doing it as well as you know that Christ has died to help you do. It doesn't matter, up or down, back and forth, God loves you. Watch me, Daddy. Watch me. His eye is on the sparrow, and his eye is watching you. Can you rejoice and have fun? To begin to push into this and all aspects of what it means to be you living your life, can you rejoice in God when things are going well and when things are going wrong? So let's start with this. I'm going to have to cough again. I'm really struggling with my sinuses today. (laughs) move to Florida you can drown without being near a lake Mm. (laughs) so uh, where was I oh yeah watch me daddy Uh, enjoyment enjoyment is always pleasure from a connection hear that again there's a lot of definitions out there even if you don't have the web you've got your own working definition of what pleasure and enjoyment is but it really is connection Even my uh, friends that like a lot of alone time, uh, they say, well, no, I find enjoyment from reading a book, sitting by the lake, walking through the woods alone. Uh, I I find enjoyment in music by myself. But it's still a connection. You're connecting to another person. You're connecting to something that someone created, something that someone is giving life to. It doesn't matter whether it's Karen Carpenter singing one of her favorite songs. It doesn't matter whether it's the trail in the woods that somebody else blazed. It doesn't matter whether it's a good book that makes you, you know, get excited, juices flow through you, or maybe make you sad, and so you are reliving someone else's failed romance, whatever it is. But it's still about the connection. So um, a connection is designed to bring you happiness. That's where pleasure comes from. So look at your life. How are you connected? To whom are you connected? If it's simply living an isolated existence, then the truth is it's going to be hard, no matter what I reveal in God's word today, to you to really find joy. So maybe for you, the the takeaway for today's talk is I need to get more connected. Especially as we get older, our friends and family begin to what? They begin to die. They begin to move away. You know, and... uh, you know, just like my grandmother, she amazed an eight-year-old boy because she rolled down a hill. You know what? You can make younger friends. You can make new older friends. But the thing is, continue to make new connections. Now, our primary connection as Christians is between us and who? God. So he's meant to be our primary source of, of uh, pleasure in the present moment. So connecting with God is a great way. Even if you feel isolated from the rest of the world, connecting with God is a great way to experience joy. Even instead of being on top of the mountain, you feel like the mountain is on top of you. So here's the deal. Happiness, true joy, comes from friends. It comes from families. It can even come from sports. Unless, of course, you're an Ohio State fan and you got beat by Michigan. (laughs) But even that, I find joy in that because then I remember they're part of the Big Ten. Go Big Ten. And then even if the Big Ten is doing bad, I remember that at least we still have football, right? So there's always something to find joy in. So Romans 15, 13. 
Just so you think this, or know that this comes out of God's word and not just some wishful thinking on the part of a preacher. Read it with me, would you? May the God of hope fill you with all joy. So where is the ultimate source of joy for a Christian? God. And joy is connected with peace. There's a peace that passes understanding. Sometimes you're not going to understand your circumstances, but you can accept the peace and the joy of Christ, that God has still got this. Make sense? So as you do what? Trust in him. In other words, he's got it. So that you may what? Overflow with hope. Where did that hope come from? The God of hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it really does start with this personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ so you can be infilled by the Holy Spirit. Do you trust in that God? Three words I want you to remember this morning as we go through today's talk. The first one is, now I've got to remember, uh, discernment. Thank you for discerning that. And the second one is contentment. And the third one is faith. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go to the doctor, they always give me a test. But instead of three words, they give me five. I remember I went to the VA and uh, she gave me five words. And I remembered four right away at the end of this 30-minute interview or whatever it was. And then for the fifth, I couldn't remember it for love nor money. You know what it was? Church. She said, Freudian slip. And I go, probably. <laughs> so here's three words. Discernment, contentment, and faith. There's going to be a quiz. So what are the three words? Discernment, contentment, and faith. If you combine those three together, you will discover a joy that will stay, sustain you no matter what circumstances you are in. You see, happiness is not a goal. It's not something that you can build or even achieve. Happiness is a byproduct of your connections, of your relationships, first and foremost with God, uh, but also within you. Some of you just don't like yourself very well. And so even when you put on the ritz, even when you put on the mask to the rest of the world, people who are discerning can tell that this is not the real you. It feels like you're just a little bit left or a little bit right of the one who's standing in front of us. You're living in the past, you're hoping for a better tomorrow, but you're not in the present moment. So real happiness comes by your connections, first and foremost with God, and then with a connection to yourself, your true self, your authentic self, not the one that your parents told you you had to be, not the one that your church said you must be, not the one, it's who you really are. What makes you happy to be living in this present moment? It's not a goal. It's not something you build or achieve. Happiness is a byproduct of loving, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving who? Your neighbor as yourself. It's about loving and being loved. We can make ourselves incredibly unhappy, even though we're a church person. We can make ourselves incredibly unhappy by being unloving to ourselves. It spills out in being judgmental. It spills out in negative interpretations of what people do and don't do. Some think that fun is frivolous. And unfortunately, some of the people that think that are Christians. There is no such thing, really, as a sour and dour Christian. You are meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not to live a Pollyannish existence where you pretend everything's good, but you accept that it is good. The Hebrew Bible that you and I call the Old Testament, in the beginning God created it. At the end of each day he said, and it was, the Hebrew word is tov. It's not just good as a grade. It's, it is, in essence, good. Even when death entered the world, even when sin entered your and my world, it is still a tov world, even though it doesn't feel like it in the moment. Jesus said this in John 10.10. 10. Well, actually, I want to do this first. Can you read that with me? Read it together. God wants you to have fun. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, God wants you to have fun. Some of you are going, that ain't right. <laughs> no, God really wants you to have fun. Whoa, these are two adults. They're probably in their 50s, and what are they doing? 
We had the staff for the church and the preschool over at Camp Maryland's back there going, whoop, whoop, whoop. We had them over the, the parsonage for a, a staff Christmas party. And we had fun. We did, the, you know, uh, name that Christmas tune with charades, not charades, what do you call it? Pictionary. And we found some people who were artists and some that aren't. Uh, and then we'd sing the Christmas carol. We had fun. And to end the night together, we had a snowball fight. Yeah, yeah, we did. I brought out a big bucket of snowballs, and they don't melt, so it was good. Uh, and so I started throwing them at people, and they went like this. You know, they didn't say it, but they're saying, man, he's a preacher. He's a preacher. He's having fun. He can't do it. And you know, some people hadn't had fun in a while because they picked up a snowball, and they're like, can I throw this? And then they threw like a girl. <laughs> I had so much fun and in about oh eight to ten minutes they were into it I, it was hard to get control back it was like this morning's children chat with my little friends um, they were having fun they were playing together and suddenly we were a team we were a family that's what fun does that's what pleasure does you and I we were made not just for God's pleasure but for our pleasure, to pleasure, to enjoy one another's company. When was the last time you threw a snowball at somebody? <laughs> Maybe it's time for you to do that. All right, so here's we go. Uh, if you think that that is not good, if you really think that Christians should be sour and dour, that we shouldn't have fun, that we should you know, focus on the negative, that everything should be a blue Christmas instead of a white Christmas, you're in the wrong playbook. And here's how I know that to be true. Read John 10.10 10 with me, would you? The thief's purpose, who is the thief? Satan. So the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy joy. Anytime somebody's being a joy sucker, and even Peter, you know, Jesus said to his best friend, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus was finding joy in his ultimate purpose, which was to go to Jerusalem and to die the most meaningful death ever to die on Calvary's cross for you and me. And, and Peter said, no, that's going to mess up my agenda. I plan on writing this thing for a while. And Jesus said, no, don't stand between me and my destiny. Get behind me. Satan, even Peter, was playing the part that Satan had written for him. And once in a while, we do too. When we take the joy, suck the happiness out of a situation or a person, we are playing the part of Satan. So the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But the purpose of Christ is what? Read it with me. To give life in all its fullness. Not just to survive. Not to just, oh, you know, poor, pitiful me. You know, let's form a pity party. Oh, this is my small group. No, 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 no. It's not just to survive. We're meant to thrive in Christ. In Christ. Uh, discernment. Discernment is really what we're talking about. The sermon is not what should I do, it's what must I do. Okay, so the first step. What are the three words? Discernment, contentment, and faith. You got it. See, you've got this down already. So the first step to joy is discernment. Just listen. I pray that your, what? Love for each other will overflow. Not just be marginal, not just be, well, you know, Jesus said I have to love you, therefore, oh, I love you. No, 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 no. It's so that you love yourself. You like yourself. You have a sense of who you are and what brings you pleasure. And you share that with other people so that you will grow in your what? Knowledge and understanding. That is discernment. How many of you know yourself? How many of you know your body? How many of you know what genuinely brings you pleasure? Not what the world has said, not what the church has said, but what brings you pleasure? Some things are pleasurable for almost all of humanity. Some things are pleasurable exclusively to a small part of humanity, including you. Some people uh, uh, handle a compliment very well, and they're secretly pleased when somebody notices what they did. And then there's other people like me. If you give me a compliment, I'll slough it off. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it was a great, great sermon, great funeral, great whatever. And I'll go, yeah, 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 but, you know, it's because they're a nice person. A friend of mine, Sylvia Russell, a great counselor, um, said, Jerry, when you uh, dismiss or diminish a compliment, you're actually slapping the person. And I go, what? 
You know, she said, when somebody gives you a compliment, and I'm talking to some of you here right now, when, when someone gives you a compliment, you just say, thank you very much. That makes me feel good. Okay? That's okay. Don't be a joy sucker. Let your love for each other uh, help you to discern what makes you feel good and what makes others feel good. So read it with me, would you, the rest of this. I want you to understand what really matters. What really matters is those connections. What really matters is that relationship so that you may what? Live pure and blameless lives until Christ returns again. Christ is coming. The first coming, Christmas, is behind us. The next coming, the end of the age, is on its way. We only have so much time. The Christ said that we work, we build the kingdom while there is daylight because the night will come. You only have so much time with that person. You know, I've had too many times where I had uh, an older couple and one was fairly infirm and the other one was their caregiver. And so everybody was preparing for the infirm to go. And guess who went first? The caregiver. And sometimes it was because they wore out, and sometimes it's just because they didn't share honestly their struggles because it was all about their mate. Live pure and blameless lives. Be honest with who you are. I'm not saying with everybody. When somebody says, how you doing, you don't have to go through your laundry list of what medications you're taking, for crying out loud. But you need to be honest. Well, you know, today I'm not feeling too good. And we don't do that because we're afraid we're going to add someone else's burden. But if they're a friend... If they're in that circle of family, then be honest. Share it honestly, quickly, concisely, and then ask them to pray for you. And then turn it around. How can I pray for you? Give them permission to connect with you and to share not just the trouble, but the great joy that we can find in living life together. So really, uh, discernment is not so much about what should I do. Discernment is about what do I want to do and how can I fulfill the desires that God has given me and respect and honor others? So how do you get in touch with that desire? Uh, this is going to surprise some of you. Uh, and uh, you say, well, you can't say that in church, but it's true. I'm not talking about coveting. We already preached against that in the Big Ten. But I am talking about knowing what you really want. Some of you think that's sinful, that you should know what you want. And that's just simply not true. Look at your envy. The things that you look at in the world. The things that you look at in other people and say, oh, I wish that was mine. Oh, I, I wish that that was true of me. Then that's what you value. That's a dial on the dashboard of your life called desire. It tells you what you want. So when Paul says to the church at Philippi, I pray that your love for each other will, will overflow and that you'll grow in your knowledge and understanding first, like, like uh, Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. What brings you desire? What, what brings you joy and pleasure? So here's the deal. Most of you have been told what you should want. That's called marketing. But here's a newsflash. You and I, we are not markets. Only you can figure out what it is that you really desire. What brings you pleasure and what causes you pain. So the first step in genuine joy is discernment. It's an inside job. You have to look at the way God has wired you. You have to figure out and understand what brings you pleasure. The second step in genuine joy is actually a clicker that works, uh, is contentment. Contentment. Uh, let's read this whole thing together. I have learned how to be happy, whether I have much or little. I have learned the secret of living in every situation whether with a full stomach or empty, I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength I need. A lot of you have memorized Philippians 4.13, that last sentence there. But it's based on, it's got the context of the first two. Uh, the Apostle Paul, shipwrecked, snake bitten, uh, beaten, flogged. Um, he eventually is dragged in chains to Rome and is killed. He's martyred for his faith. But he said, I have learned the secret of living. I have learned how to be happy, how to be content, and it's with whose help? The help of God in Jesus Christ. I can do all things, not just the good things, not the things that are inconvenient or convenient. I can do all things with this present help called Jesus Christ. In his book, The Paradox of Choice, Barry Schwartz describes the difference between two types of people. And we're in this 
one side or the other or somewhere in between. He describes uh, either we're satisficers or we are maximizers. And here's the difference. Uh, Let's say there's an ugly sweater contest coming up. And a satisficer and a maximizer are both going to the ugly sweater contest. Well, the satisficer goes to the, to the Goodwill store, looks at a rack. There's basically three sweaters that'll fit him. So he looks at them, picks one, goes up, pays for it, and is happy. That's a satisficer, okay? Now, uh, someone else uh, goes to not one Salvation Army store, but goes to 30 stores, tries on 40 sweaters, puts four on hold, and doesn't buy a single one. Then they go home and they're unhappy. Why? Because they don't have a sweater for the ugly sweater contest, okay? Uh, The Apostle Paul says, I have learned the secret of living. If you are constantly looking, if you are constantly unsatisfied with what you have or what you have found, then you understand what Mick Jagger sang. If you know it, sing it. I can't get no satisfaction though I try and I try and I try I can't get no satisfaction okay that's as much as we need this isn't a rock concert but but it's true and not just for that generation it's true for all of us there's a little bit of satisficer in us okay that's good enough and there's a little bit of maximizer in each of us that I'm still looking that I still haven't gotten in touch with something because I think there's something perfect out there. Some people do that with jobs. They hop from job to job. Some people do it with churches, jumping from church to church. Some people do it with spouses, hopping from spouse to spouse. A good friend of mine whose daddy used to be the uh, hanging Judge Roy Bean, granddaddy was hanging Judge Roy Bean in Texas, uh, Roz said, you know, Jerry, my sister's been married five times. I go, really? She says, she's still not happy. <laughs> she said, I married one. Her husband, Hawk Eskew, was a really good friend of mine, uh, Air Force pilot, a great guy. But he was a guy in every sense of that word. She said, I married one. Hawk's not the best, but you know what? He's good enough. <laughs> and Hawk would just smile because he knew that was true. I mean, every man I know is married above himself, quite honestly. But I have learned how to be happy, the secret of living is maximizing what you need to be satisfied with, okay? So if you have a satisfaction deficit, remember Bing Crosby and White Christmas, we saw that last night. Do you remember the one song in there that deals with being satisfied? If you're worried and you can't sleep, try counting blessings instead of sheep. So, and soon you'll fall asleep. The truth is most of us have been blessed beyond our deserving by the Lord who is the lover of your soul. So count your blessings. Move towards the satisfier instead of the maximizer. I'll only be happy if that's not where hope and happiness lives. It's not in the future. It's learning to be happy here and now. The first step to genuine joy is discernment. The second step is what we talked about. It's called contentment. And what's the third step? faith. When I ask people what brings them joy or satisfaction, they might bring a couple things out. You guys did better than most, honestly. But a lot of times, instead of telling me what brings them joy or satisfaction, they immediately jump to the joy suckers, the the disease, the divorce, the difficulty, the death, as if those joy suckers disqualify them from being happy. I can't look at who I am. I can't discern what would bring me happiness right now because I'm broken. Well, Jesus Christ is better than super glue. He puts the pieces back together and they stay together. Feelings are just like a compass. They're real. Don't diminish them and don't dismiss them. Your feelings are real. They tell us what direction to go in. Do I feel good about this or do I feel bad about this? But you are a free agent. You are an adult. You are designed to be mature in your thinking process in Jesus Christ. You chart your course and you set your sails no matter what's happening around you. And that is called discernment and that is called faith. And that determines your destination. Not what's happened to you, but how you are responding to it. Edward Moat wrote just one Christian hymn in his lifetime. 
My hope is built on than Jesus' blood and righteousness. In that hymn, he reminds us that Jesus Christ is the solid rock upon which we stand. And it comes from this verse. Most people think it comes from the Old Testament. The story that we're talking about is in the Old Testament, but the the verse that you're looking for is actually found in the writings of Paul. Just listen. Talking about genuine faith, how joy can be sustained. He says, I don't want you to forget what happened to our ancestors in the wilderness. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Israelites Moses led out of 400 years of captivity in Egypt. They endured a lot of trouble in 400 years, right? Uh, No matter how bad you think your life is, uh, you weren't born to slave parents who were born to slave parents who were born to slave parents. You had nothing. Somebody else decided where you slept, when you got up, what you did, and when you went to bed, and what you had to eat in between. No matter how hard your life is, you have not lived that life. So he says, I don't want you to forget what happened to our ancestors in the wilderness. Life was difficult for the people he's writing to. Rome was not a kind and benevolent dictatorship. All right? He says, don't forget that God got our ancestors through something even worse than this. God guided all of them. How many did he guide? All. Any who would follow the star. Any who would follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. They ate the same miraculous food. What's that called? manna and they drank the miraculous water most christians i find don't remember this story and it amazes me so where did they get water in the wilderness from a rock and here is where it ties into that song that you know so well the rock that traveled with them is who jesus christ so god met their needs in the wilderness and god will meet your needs in the wilderness of your life too You pray that God will give you the strength you need. Well, here it is. It comes through your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. Discern what brings you pleasure. Be content with what God has brought to you. And then trust what God will get you through. How many of you remember the company called Kodak? What was Kodak known for? Pictures, right? Yeah, cameras and stuff like that. You know what? They don't exist anymore. You know why? They didn't keep up. You know, first it was Polaroid who put them on the ropes, and they had to develop their own instant camera. And then what was the death knell for film? Digital cameras. Oh, my gosh. Oh, we got boxes of real pictures, and we got tens of thousands of other pictures we won't look at any more than we pull those boxes out. And I suspect you are the same way. Kodak is, was the memory merchant that's now become a memory They were locked into a past that was wonderful. But you can't drive your car looking through the rear view mirror. Why is that? Because you're going to crash and burn. You'll follow the Kodak principle. Uh, You need to make new memories. You need to make new friends. You need to trust that Christ is leading you through the wilderness that you're in right now. Uh, So let's say this. Hmm. Let's say it's your 25th wedding anniversary. What, what wedding anniversary? What medal? It's your silver wedding anniversary. And you have never done anything for your wife uh, for your anniversary. So this year is going to be special. It's your 25th. So you begin to think. You go on Pinterest, look for ideas. You talk to the kids. They're like, oh, Dad. And so you decide you're going to make this very special. So you make reservations at the restaurant that you, got, that you proposed in. And, you know, miracle of miracles, she said Yes. And so you make reservations. You ask for the exact same table you were at because she said once, maybe she should say yes again, right? And so you arrive at the restaurant and COVID is going on. Everybody has to wear a face mask. Well, that's not what I planned. And your table has got somebody else sitting in it. The only table available is next to the kitchen door. And so while you're trying to remember the past, uh, you get really frustrated with the present because while you're trying to say, do you remember the honeymoon? Do you remember the heart-shaped uh, hot tub? Do you remember, uh, you know, all this stuff and all the romances sucked out of the conversation with, hey, table number three needs dessert. And you're going, really? Really? It's not what I imagined. So you become angry and pretty soon you're not doing anything. You're not in the moment. Life is what happens to your plan. And you can become angry, you can become sullen, or you can be like this woman. 
you can make the best of everything. You say, but Jerry, that's, no, that's faith. It really is. Forget all that Sunday school stuff. I love Sunday school, but at the end of the day, you've got to think as an adult. It is what it is. It'll be what you make of it. Say that with me. It is what it is. It'll be what I make of it. So you can complain about the restaurant. You can complain about the rain. You can complain about COVID. Or you can look around right now because joy lives where? In the present. It's good to remember the past. It's good to anticipate the future. But if you're going to find happiness, if you're going to find joy, find it here and now with the people you are with. Does that make sense? The happy people make the best of everything. Forget the world for just a minute. What you need right now is joy. Discern what will bring you happiness right now. And it's not likely to be what it was 10 years ago. It's not likely what it'll be 10 months from now. Do the homework. What will make me happy? Discernment. And then look around. Contentment. The only thing you think that'll make you happy is winning the lottery and putting $10 million in the bank. Guess what you're not going to be? Happy. But if you look around and say, you know what? I think instead of going to a restaurant in Fort Wayne, Indiana for our anniversary or for her birthday this time, we're going to go to St. Augustine. And we're going to encounter the lights of Christmas and the Christmas carols and the joy. And we'll have a nice lunch and a nice dinner and we will be present with one another. And that's going to make us both what? That's your homework. This really is the fourth week of Advent, joy. And the joy is in Jesus with the people you love and the ones that love you. Amen? Amen. All right, if you would stand and join the uh, choir in singing our closing song. Lisa, what is that song? Joy to the world. How appropriate is that? Don't you love that heartbeat? They're driving those caissons out in the river. I hear they're going to be doing that for another year or more. Happiness is what you make of it, okay? I like the beat. May the God of love, peace, hope, and joy fill you with a sense that God wants you to play. So go out and have fun. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's kids said, amen. Amen. Don't forget, open house today, 3 to 6 at the Parsonage. Come by. I hear Christmas calories are cut in half.